Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are calling to order our ISD 709 Duluth Public Schools Committee the whole meeting. This is a meeting that we have once a month. Usually it's on a Tuesday, um, but Duluth has been famous for bad weather this winter. So here we are on Thursday, April 6th. Again, we are ISD 709, the Duluth Public Schools. This is our committee of the whole meeting. Um, this is where both Assistant Superintendent Bonds and myself consistently say these are the meetings where really a lot of information is shared, a lot of in-depth questions, a lot of back and forth, and it really is um, an incredible opportunity for our community to uh, get a glimpse into all the things that are going on in, in our district, as well as our, our own glimpse into things too. So again, um, this is the committee of the whole meeting and Member Zadowski will take roll. Okay, Member Eater. Present. Uh, Member Kirby is excused. Uh, Member Lockwood Kemp? Here. Member Lopob? Here. Member Oswald? Here. I am here. Member Sandholm? Present. Superintendent Magus? Present. Assistant Superintendent Bonds? Present. Um, Deputy Clerk Zunich is excused. Um, HR Director Severance? Excused. And then Board Secretary Paquette? It's really going to be Shannon. Shannon Brown. Shannon Brown. We'll, we'll change that when we yeah. okay. well, that's, that's it on there. <laughs> Thank you. And again, this is um, a meeting, too, that's a little less formal. There isn't any formal voting going on, and um, we have presentations. And tonight um, on our agenda, we have presentations from Head Start, presentations from um, our setting for update and also from our um, school board handbook handout and science computer science um, <coughs> presentations so i'm going to turn it over to assistant superintendent bonds thank you chair Wolfo, and hello everyone and thank you for joining us and i just want to remind everyone we are up against time but we have some really um, thorough presentations and so I want to keep my intro brief and turn it over quickly to our director of Head Start, uh, Sherry Williams, who's going to walk us through our Head Start programs. Alright. I'm going to start. Well, maybe I should say hello. Hello there. I'm going to start with the self-assessment, which is the right lab. The self-assessment is um, required for us to do annually in Head Start. The self-assessment along with the community needs assessment are the drivers when we do a self-assessment, we are looking at how if, if our program is meeting the performance standards, and if we uh, any systems that we may improve upon to better meet the needs of children and families in the community. So, um, also are we achieving the goals that we intended? So, this is the third year of our. Um, we are approaching the third year in our goal site in our grant cycle. So a reminder of what our goal areas, our grant goal areas are for this five-year grant cycle. Um, one is high quality inclusive classrooms, the other walking the talk of equity and inclusion, a third fostering resilience with a focus on health and wellness. And then in terms of just looking at our program, we looked at program management and quality improvement and parent family community engagement and transportation. So in our self-assessment, we split into those five groups to analyze our program and look at how we're doing. We always start with program strengths when we do the self-assessment, and one of our greatest strengths is that we're part of the school district. So that allows us the opportunity to work with other departments, um, <coughs> collaborate closely with early childhood special education, which is important. <coughs> Department and the Office of Equity, uh, Educational Equity are all important uh, people that we feel our departments collaborate well. It can be challenging to be a part of the school district because we don't exactly fit perfectly, but we work hard to, to work together. So, our management team devised a self assessment plan with tasks and timeline. I talked about the five areas that we looked at and what we do is look at the strengths and weaknesses of each one of those areas, try to identify data sets that will help us answer how we're doing, 
Um, and we try to have those teams have a management team member, a teacher, a parent, and in some cases, a community member with some expertise on the topic. If parents don't come, we can follow up with phone calls or surveys and we can augment our, our input with that. So I'm flipping ahead to the key insights. <coughs> If we just look at our progress on our goals, when we look at high quality inclusive classrooms, program wide PLCs were implemented along with the Early Childhood Special Ed Department. We saw some great improvement. Um, so, because we are one grade level, we identified some, um, some scores that were teacher scores. So our teachers are evaluating using the class evaluation system and we try to bump up an area in that. And uh, our social emotional tool that we use is pyramid in preschool, like PBIS and the grades. And there is a measurement, a fidelity tool that we were able to identify some calls from. And uh, so we've always been setting a social emotional goal based upon the pyramid and an academic goal based upon so we wanted to move our instructional support from a 64% to an 80% as measured by the class. And uh, after one year of PLC, we were able to get it to 70, we were able to increase it by 10%. I will say that I've just completed my final class of this year, and I will hit the goal. So um, that PLC really does make a huge difference, and having targeted goals to work towards this was we wanted at least 80% of our teams to collect behavior incident reports and to put those into the system that we use um, with the pyramid model. And we did reach that goal that year. So, Sherry, can I, I just, it slipped by me quick. Can you say yeah. the goal was set at what? Did you say 84%? 64% we wanted to move it to 80. And we moved it to 75. And that's in what time frame? One school year. Thank you. Um, we did a great job with our PLCs in the 21-22 school year, and this year they sort of fell off the track. So we started the year with um, some corrective action and really realized that what we needed to do was strengthen our teams. Um, and so. Uh, that was a focus. Our focus this year has been creating a culture of restorative practices because we know that our staff are able to have courageous conversations, um, to point out when things don't seem right, to talk about how great things are when things are going well, and it's, it's the teams that are in the classrooms that really need to be able to talk to each other and have honest conversations, and that that isn't easy to do. And so we've spent a lot of time working on how do we do that and how important it is to be able to do that. We are so aware that we serve the most vulnerable kids. That almost makes me cry, but I don't have time for that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we our do. kids deserve the best. <laughs> There's no doubt. Moving forward, we have a renewed commitment to the PLC process, um, and we will link those goals to our program-wide goals, goals, which will in turn be linked to the group of the school goals. So we've got a system in place to, to do PLC right next year. We'll talk more about it. Um, another thing about high-quality inclusive classrooms is we monitor the rate of growth for students on IEPs. We compare that to the rate of growth on students not on IEPs and students on IEPs experience with them with growth in our classrooms. Uh, up there's a 200% in some cases. I share some of that data with you. And finally, within that goal, uh, the behavior incident reported, report data tracking is so incredible. It's giving us amazing um, information. Uh, it has an equity tool embedded inside of it, and what we realized looking at our data this year is that boys are more than twice as likely to have behavior incident reports filed. And so we know we've got some work to do. <coughs> Second grant goal, walking the talk of equity. Nature play, we put under this and also the health and wellness because um, nature-based preschools are the fastest growing type of preschool in Duluth. 
and high tuition rates make them out of reach for families experiencing poverty. And so in our public school preschool, we are providing this opportunity to all of us. Oshkin Raymond, in the 21-22 school year, American Indian students were our highest performing demographic. I've shared that data in this packet. In the current year, we've had staffing changes happen in Oshkin Raymond um, that were concerning. Um, the biggest question being, can we have this program if we don't have a native American teacher? Um, after much stress, I called every single parent who had a child in Oshkin Raymond, and they have assured us that we can. They really appreciate having a space where they can be together. And in our program, all of the students that are in that classroom are affiliated in some way with the tribe. So um, having a community of people with shared cultural identity is very important to our learning. Um, the data that's shared is our data from last year by race. So, uh, right now, success of the program is based on student achievement, but the family testimonials that we heard when we made those phone calls really was important to do that for our program. We will be expanding Ojibwe words and phrases throughout our program this year, so we'll start a slow, gradual expansion of Ojibwe language across the program. And finally, our equity team is part of Walking the Talk of Equity. It has merged with the Office of Educational Equity Advisory Committee and the subcommittee, so we are now part of EAD. Um, we do continue to offer annual book studies for teachers on anti-racist ideals. This year, they are working their reading the book, White Fragility. There are five or six participants. We've had the three books that they we started with How to Be an Anti-Racist, last year, The New Jim Crow, this year, White Fragility, so um, teachers are signing up for those, and they're really great. Uh, PD offered through the news and views. School readiness is always the grand goal in Head Start, and so our grand goal is that uh, all students will be at 85% or higher for all four-year-olds across all funding streams, and you can see our data from last year to show us that we meet that goal. We focus a lot on the first six weeks of school with teachers setting an optimal learning environment, um, which may include modifying the environment to meet the needs of the students in front of you, or gradually increasing stamina or scaffolding for various reasons, but we take those first six weeks of school and we hold them carefully. Um, to teach the children in front of you, not uh, I don't know if that's just that. But <laughs> so we need to wish teach the students in front of us, yeah. not the students we wish we had. Or you had five years ago. <laughs> exactly. Or or it looks the way you like it. I think it should. So we also are committed to play based learning. So we know that leaving ample time for play and supporting kids' ability to engage in play is paramount in a successful learning equation. <laughs> Our final grant goal is fostering resilience with a focus on health and wellness. Major play falls there too. So 100% of families believe it's important <coughs> to spend time in nature according to our own survey. We have a study with UMB that reveals that spending some time in nature increases students' executive function. The growth rates were so high, it's believed that time in nature may help to close achievement gaps. And so in this study, which is published, um, we are the middle bar, the blended nature. So our students experience more growth than um, students with higher socioeconomic status in uh, more nature-based programming. Super exciting stuff. That's what we're taking to the National Head Start Association. Everybody needs to know that it's possible to do that and it's good for kids. Um, also, there are fewer behavior incidents outside, so kids are more successful outside. So, uh, almost 80% of behavior incidents happen inside of the classroom, um, and really only 10% of behavior incidents. Let's have on a play space. So natural play environments are places where kids do some great play and we have very little behavior incidents on there. 
We have a partnership with the Y. We've been offering our full day classrooms to make safety around water, which is an anti-drowning class. Uh, so 72 kids a year participate in that. It takes us two years to get through all of our classrooms, um, but the Y really finds it successful. Um, every time we do it, we learn more about how to make it better. Um, we had some head start days at the Y in 21-22, and several families attended. The numbers were low, but the impact was pretty high. They, they streamlined uh, uh, scholarship application for our, our families. And this year, the Y provided our program with family day classes for all Head Start families, um, and is offering free swimming lessons to our families uh, and their siblings. So we have got some great, our partnership with the Y is strong, very powerful. Um, creating a culture of safety is part of our health and wellness, so we spent a lot of professional development time looking at how staff as individuals and as teams respond to challenging behaviors, and we have developed a monitoring system to make sure that we are seeing all uh, elements of active supervision in place in every classroom as a result. <coughs> health and wellness for staff, we know that our teachers have been feeling very overwhelmed. So they are requesting more time to team, plan, and engage in reflective practice. Um, and restorative practices have been the focus of four staff training sessions. And when we look at our program management and quality improvement, um, ongoing monitoring uh, became something that we knew we needed to do more of. So we've been visiting classrooms and looking for certain seeing if certain things are in place. So we're targeting some, checking to see, is this in place? When we talk about it, but do we already see it in place? And so that has been a new layer of um, managing our program. And then every year I labor over the self-assessment process and tweak it to try to make it better and better. So that is also something that is continuous work. And finally, our last area is family engagement, enrollment, and transportation. We have been under enrolled this year for several reasons. Uh, one is half day sessions. Families are asking for full day sessions. And so at two of our sites, the half day classes are at half capacity. So that's significant to know. Teachers are also asking for no additional students to be added when they've got very challenging behaviors in the classroom. And that hard to not do, so we usually apply that. Um, uh, and then there are larger systemic issues that impact our enrollment, and that is a lack of transportation for three-year-olds, and uh, a lack of transportation at midday for those half-day classes, and a lack of wraparound child care. Those are systemic problems that we face. Family engagement, we have a lot of schools not allowing preschool parents to escort children into schools. They've developed drop-off systems that happen outside, so uh, and are just sticking with that for safety and traffic movement uh, in the parking lot. And that loses some connecting points for our family advocates, whose job is to connect with families. Um, and so they're working on ways to better engage and better document our connections and the effects that we do have on families. And in transportation, we did have this incident happen, so we're working with the transportation department to make sure the systems are in place on the other hand. So our recommendations based upon our self-assessment are the following five that we will use ongoing monitoring tools to track safety and compliance, that will train PLC plus teacher leaders to guide our PLCs, that will continue to increase our data capacity in all areas, including PF parent family community engagement in the self-assessment process. That we will seek to convert two half-day classrooms to full-day classrooms and to explore potential wraparound child care. And that we'll continue our commitment to restorative practices, to keep our teams strong, and be able to have those courageous conversations that help us keep our, um, our classrooms healthy. Are there any questions? Oh, yeah. I, I would just comment that, you know, I, 
I'm the liaison to the Head Start Governing Board of Parents, and I so monthly uh, hear what parents have to say about the program, as well as the discussions, and it's an impressive group of parents that question and give feedback and, and uh, speak so, so highly of what they, as well as their kids, are benefiting and their families are benefiting from participating. So thank you for letting me participate. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, um, really glad to hear the, just the reflection and I guess the data that you've collected on the half day sessions. I know a lot of people who are facing, you know, economic and transportation barriers and that's the biggest barrier for them is, is that not having that bus ride, um, not being able to, you know, they can't get into the full day. So that's great to hear. Um, I would be really interested at maybe this is a conversation for another day, but to, to know more about that equity tool that you built into the behavior data tracking. Um, that, I mean, you had great impact from that. Um, it seems like it would be something that we should share. Um, it's built in itself. I, I yeah. would love to take credit for that. It's just part of the system. Okay, it got it. Tools in it. Yeah. So, so you'll see it gradually when it starts to get disproportionate, it will slowly the data will start to change colors. So it's very, you can't miss it when there's something that needs to be corrected. We have one more question here, and then do you have more that you want to present? I'm just trying to make sure yes, I time. Yes, thank you. Yes, so thank you. if we can keep that in mind um, so that uh, Director Reeves can continue with the presentation, then we can take some sure. more questions at the end. It's for the uh, presentation and the complexities of Head Start. I just wanted to say thank you for all your great leadership in the area, but we'll hear more about your great leadership as you continue with the next item. Okay. Um, I'll go down for the time to um, So I'm asking for some grants to be approved. This is grant time in Head Start. Um, the state Head Start application. <coughs> State Head Start application, state grant one major. So our state grant funds our Families in Transition program, which works with families who have experienced homelessness in the last few years or are currently homeless. Um, they work with 12 early Head Start uh, people, so from pregnant mothers to age three and five Head Start aged children, um, and our home-based program. Our home-based program this year, we are going to explore some early Head Starts. So we will go from serving all Head Start age children to um, serving some early Head Start children in year two. So the total of the state grant is $400,000. And um, you can see that it funds these teachers and it pays for some supplies and other little items listed on the bottom, but I'm asking you to approve the state Head Start grant. And we can move to the transportation data. But does it need a motion? Get a, Are we yeah. going to uh, approve? No, no that's right. It's committee of the whole. So, yeah. 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 We don't vote. Yeah. Okay, got it. So the transportation waiver for Duluth Head Start, we changed it up a little bit for a couple of, we've added a couple of safety things to it. So voluntary pre-K is required to provide transportation to and from school for four-year-olds. And due to that, we have asked for Head Start children to be able to ride the bus as well. Um, transportation can be a huge barrier for accessing families for people experiencing poverty. So there are two Head Start regulations that need to be weighed in order for our kids to ride the bus. One is for restraints, and the other is for monitors on the bus. So every year, I ask them to weigh those. Um, those are the only two things they can. Our Parent Policy Council supports this plan uh, with the following safety precautions. And here's where there's a slight change. Preschool children uh, will wear reflective vests, making them highly visible to the bus drivers and other staff both to and from school. So um, it was a, 
just making sure you can do it. <coughs> it's, it's very important. Preschool children must sit on the seats closest to the bus driver. An adult must meet the children at the bus door at drop-off and must bring the child to the bus door at pickup. And we encourage parents to establish communication with the driver. If the adult is not the child's parent, it must be someone who the parent designates that may take the child home from the bus stop. All Head Start children must participate in the bus safety presentation on the first day of school. Riding the bus is voluntary, so parents may choose to self-transport if they prefer. And in order to utilize school district busing, parents will sign an authorization form that releases students from the Head Start program to the transportation department of ISD 709. That's newly added. That's the newly added piece? That is newly added piece. Okay. Do you reflect the best as the best? What is that? Is, there, are, uh, is the reflected the best? The reflected best? I see that Piedmont. We started, you know, I think we started doing that. Maybe this might be the first official. Yeah, because they line them up at Piedmont and yeah. they all have their little reflected vests on. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and at first we thought, well, they only need to write them home. Because when they're coming to school, there's always going to be an adult there to meet them. But the bus drivers actually really wanted us to have it go both ways. Yeah. And so we responded to the bus drivers. You know, they really wanted to see it go both ways, and there's no reason not to. We so, see them every morning in their yeah. little vests, yeah. walking in. It helps everybody, really. Yeah, it does. Um, this crowded school. The like, see people. There's the preschoolers. It yeah. parts, and then they <laughs> march through. It's really cute. So. The release, is this something that we um, work with transportation on in our insurer on? I think we'll just put it in our home visit packet, just just alerting families that you are leaving the Head Start supervision and you're entering school district busing, so it's not like it's, um, you know, it's a K-5, it's a pre-K, just to really make it clear to them that this is school district busing, not a special Head Start busing. So I think it's a good extra layer of awareness. So, so is it the bus driver <clears throat> at the bus stop that's when he's dropping off the child that makes sure the child is going home with the designated person? And, and I mean, it just seems like a hectic, awkward time where the problem could occur. Right. When the bus comes to the stop, kids are anxious to get out, right. and, and maybe I even have a father there who's not permitted to take that child away, or, or some other guard Right, right, Cold. right. Right now, what we're depending on is that um, the person is at the stop at the correct time and the child is getting up to a recognized adult and that a relationship is being established between the bus driver and the parent. And so that's sort of what we've depended on to be the, uh, the system. We know that the bus drivers can access emergency contact information. All of our kids are in the main campus. So if that person were a different person, say an emergency drop-off, they could access that on the main campus to see, oh, this is, this is a person that's okay. So, so at our schools, we have a system where, you know, this parent is not allowed to come to school and pick up that child. Mm -hmm. If that occurs and gets started, would the same thing apply so that that bus driver would know that? Right. Like an order for protection or something along right. those lines. Yes. Right. So all of our kids are also in campus. So that's different. I mean, that actually hasn't always been the case, um, but they are all in infant campus. So all their safety flags. Also, the bus drivers have um, two documents. They have their route, and then they have a driver's folder. And the driver's folder is for all students who may have special, have, you know, they may be, have an allergy that a bus driver needs to be aware of. All early childhood children are in that folder, um, so they're kind of considered a special population. So, 
So we're trying to put some safety things in place, realizing that it's tricky and it's a bus that's on a route that's right. got a lot of kids to drop. That is the conundrum. Well, yeah, I can see a kind of confrontational situation. You know, where I mean, where the, the young child would recognize that adult person, mm -hmm. but then that child shouldn't be leaving the, the bus with that adult person. Mm -hmm. right? So if they're flagged, is that the last student to get off the bus at that stop? You know, I mean, so again, it, it just seems like a very potentially hectic mm -hmm. and problematic situation. Mm -hmm. That, that, I don't know, I guess all, all of the, the issues can be really looked at from top to bottom, start right. to finish. Right, right. On that note, I'm, I'm assuming there's some sort of protocol, probably with the transportation company, if someone's not there. Right. You know, right. There has and to be. And that's more than the problem. Yeah. You know, those scenarios have a come from, but that scenario has come up. And so they're returned back to the school. So. Um, and we're collecting data on that. Um, so anytime a child is returned, we want to be alerted of that so that we can say the system is working. So we're starting to a data collection on that, right? Is this what other districts do to transport their early childhood? Or is Duluth unique in, in the, the need that we have to um, enroll our preschool? It's, it's better to get our kids in school early. We know that. So it's transportation nice. like this? Yeah, not happening in too many districts? Yeah, it's the Head Start performance standards that are so, so stringent about transportation that make it really hard. I did check with other Head Starts who utilize, you know, there are other Head Starts where the district is not the grantee, but the Head Start's located in the school and they use school district funds. You know, they use school district transportation. And um, some of them have the kids sign out of Head Start and sign, you know, it's called it on, you know, an unsupervised log, which didn't sound like, uh, it didn't sound right to me, but this signature on the bottom here, I'm hoping will just be an alert to families that are not in a Head Start classroom anymore, so. And how long have we been transporting our students like I know that every year we've been voting on this transportation yeah. waiver. I think 2017 was the year that yeah. voluntary pre-K came, and as soon as voluntary pre-K came, because uh, long ago Head Start had its own Head Start busing, and it became cost prohibitive. And then there was a period of time where there was no transportation provided for Head Start. And then in 2017, when voluntary pre-K came and required transportation, then we can hop on the bus. Um, our four-year-olds, and so that has only been happening since 2017, and there have been some issues. There's no lack, um, and so. And I, and I do want to jump in and thank uh, Director um, for this work because I know she and her team are working hard to put in some safety precautions and measures to ensure students don't uh, find themselves uh, in any kind of situation. You also have to think about we have our five-year-olds on the bus as well. Um, we're a school district. Things happen, unfortunately, and we try our best to make sure that we minimize those things, even with our youngest partners. So uh, I want to thank you for these recommendations on trying to increase safety and um, transporting of kids. Do you have any other documents that you can go through? I do. I'll just keep going. Um, I think I have my documents in the room. Okay, I'll just go with my sheet. Uh, Head Start Enrollment Reduction. So we are requesting to convert two half-day classes to full-day classes for the following reasons. They've been severely under-enrolled. When the, these same classrooms had higher enrollment, there was also a higher volatility in numbers. So people would sign up and drop, and sign up and drop, and sign up and drop. So we know, based upon those two things, and that when families rank their choices for classrooms, half-day classrooms are typically not first choice. Uh, and the opportunity for transportation comes with full day classes. So, for those reasons, we would like to convert two half day classrooms uh, one at Minus Wilkins and one at Lauren Parker to full day classes. Uh, that conversion results in a reduction of the Head Start students. 
So it reduces, uh, it has us going from 224 Head Start students to 190, so it's 34 slots we'd be reducing. Um, we have to show that those 34 slots could be picked up somewhere else in the community, and I think our community needs assessment to really demonstrate that. Um, what happens with an enrollment reduction is you end up getting more money per child, right? Because our costs will be the same. We'll still have full-time teachers. You know, we'll see. There'll be minimum cost reductions, but nothing significant. Um, so currently, we receive $12,523 per child enrolled in Head Start, and with the reduction, it will increase to $14,764 per child in Head Start. Um, it sounds like a lot, but when you compare the cost per child to all the Head Start programs in Minnesota, the range is from $9,000, 9 or $10,000, all the way up to $28,000. So we're right in the middle of the pack with, with that number. That increased cost per child also will result in an increased um, state Head Start dollars <coughs> because all of those grants are based on your rate per child. So um, there is a financial gain, but that is certainly not what we are looking for. We're really looking just to make needs and families better. So, <coughs> no reduction. Do we, will we maintain then any half time classrooms? Yes, there still will be three. Okay, okay. And those are have got fine enrollment, so it's we're really targeting those ones that really pay, not after Okay. And where are those sites? Uh, Myers Wilkins and Warren MacArthur. So they will have just full days in those two sites. What were the half day sites? Um, where are the additional ones? Where were the re retaining that three half day sites? Um, Piedmont and Lester Park and Lowell. And by going to full-time um, classrooms at Myers and Laurel, are there um, classroom needs for that or do, does it just get absorbed that half-day classroom that was used for half-day is the same classroom yeah. that will be used so that you don't need another space? No. Okay. So Director Williams and I talked about this in terms of I'm sure just trying to make yeah. sure it really um, that we really assess this well um, if this is adopted as a practice for next year, uh, so that we can assess if they had any impact on either further decreasing enrollment or did it have an impact on either increasing or maintaining enrollment because it is really important that we you know, provide this level of services for our youngest learners, especially for marginalized communities. So that, that's one that you and I had a lot of conversation around. I don't want to create a situation where we are further um, causing this opportunity to be missed by, again, some of our students, students especially our marginalized communities. So right. if, if implemented, we're going to really assess and see if it improves enrollment or um, makes it uh, bigger. Right. I would just add, I heard at the parent meeting, the parent voices who represent each of these different sites really spoke highly for that need for full day. All right. Mm -hmm. So we'll move on to the Head Start Clothing Quality Improvement and Supplemental Allegations. So cost of living adjustment uh, is large this year. We weren't expecting um, this large of a, of a COLA. That's $143,865. And we'll use it to cover the 7% premium benefit increase next year and a salary increase of 2.5%. And the remaining funds will be used to offset increased operating costs in budget, other budget areas. Uh, it cannot be used for staff, so that is unfortunate. Uh, the quality improvement uh, is uh, offered, it's been offered annually now uh, for a while, which is just monies to help us improve the quality of our program, and it can be used for personnel, and that is exactly what we will be using it for. Um, so we have a very hard time getting substitute teachers in preschool, um, and so uh, we are looking at hiring 2.4 boat substitute teachers to help us cover absences, and when uh, no absence is needed to uh, help to reduce the adult child nutrition classrooms and child behavior. 
Can I go back up to the cost of living adjustment when it says that the it will be used to cover the 7% fringe and then an increase of 2.5 salary, but yet you said it can't be used for staff. I couldn't hire. That is enough money where I could say, well, I'd like to hire an additional person with that money. So I can't. I can only increase the salaries of existing personnel and not hire new okay. staff. Okay. But with the second one, the quality improvement, yeah, you can. I can. So. Are our Head Start teachers a part of our ISD 709 district they are, teachers? They are. Congratulations to the new public schools for having early childhood teachers as part of the teacher party. You haven't sat there? I have not sat there. I, I can certainly. I feel like I'm subbing there every day when I have my grandchildren, but you know. <laughs> Just a quick question on the quality improvement. Uh, you mentioned 2.4 floating subs and yes. a half-time social worker. The half-time social worker is an error. So we ignored okay. that second page and then show okay. that happened. I was going to say, yeah. that doesn't yeah. seem like, oh, like no, you're getting no, some no, pretty no. good deals. I, 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 I want to know I where you're getting those social workers. I, I realize there's social workers already built into our base camp. So good. I have to go back to the drawing Thank board. You. Sorry, I apologize. <laughs> That's a finally, grand 63 grant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very, very nice. Um, the last document is our Federal Head Start Continuation Grant. So you can see the total amount we're asking for a reduction. Uh, this is year three of a five year grant cycle. We've already talked about what those grant goals are in our self assessment. But I want to point out the differences that we're asking for this year. So we're asking for this conversion from uh, half days to full days at two sites. These are rationale is there. We are also asking to move to a four day. So right now our head start, our full day head start classrooms are in session two Fridays a month. And we are asking to go down to zero Fridays. And here are the reasons why. Teachers report feeling overwhelmed. They are in self-contained classrooms. They don't have access to specialists. Young children need adults in a different way than older children do. There's no downtime. So there's no checking your email. It is go the whole time they are in session. And they are feeling overwhelmed. Um, and our classrooms are in session every other Friday because it meets the teacher's contract need for prep time. And but we still are getting lots of feedback that it isn't enough. So there are benefits to the teachers and the staff. And here are some of the benefits. Time to team with early childhood special ed staff and other early childhood staff. Time to engage in PLCs and engage in reflective practice, and I should point out that reflective practice to an early childhood teacher is different than what you think of when you think of reflective practice. It's a very common mental health practice where sometimes there is some compassion fatigue because you get to know details about families that can be very difficult to, um, that can require some processing. And so reflective practice in early childhood is a mental health practice that teachers are offered to help them work through some of the, the trauma that they are aware of and a common practice. It would allow teachers to engage in effective practice-based coaching. So now we've got practice-based coaches, but no time to really meet with the teachers to discuss results of their coaching. To, to really talk with your coaches. That's an important part of coaching. To participate in individualized professional development, to allow time for one-to-one -one staff check-ins that don't interfere with planning time. We're so paranoid about planning time that it's hard for us to meet with our teachers. They are really sticking to, this is my planning time, this is my prep time, and this is my time. So. Uh, it is, it, it's very difficult. It's hard to be healthy. Uh, 
and it really does support wellness in a real and authentic way. And this is, there are other coordinated week Head Start programs. This is not an unusual thing. So uh, Head Start is not, preschool is not K-12. It, it is its own thing. It has its own needs. There are actually benefits for families. We are talking about having some family engagement activities on one of the Fridays. So when families want to come to family engagement, they want to see the teacher. And they, that's who they want to be around is the teacher. And the teacher never goes to these things because they're in the evening, they're not, you know, they're, they're burned out, really. Having this consistent schedule of no school on Fridays there's up any idea, like, is there school this Friday? Is there not school this Friday? It, there's not, there's not. Um, children also thrive with those very consistent routines. And many daycares charge for full days whether you go there or not. So if you're going every other day, there may be people who are charged for the days that they're not going to daycare. Whereas if you just start out, you know, Fridays is a day that they need some, that I need to find a way to fill in. Consistent. And then finally, individual communication with families surrounding child goals. The time you call the family to, to just connect with the family, it, it doesn't happen. You're crunched for planning time and prep time. So, so those are the reasons. And now, I want you to know that ultimately the opposite head start makes the decision. So uh, we can put this in the goal and they can come back and say, no, that, that is not in the best interest of families and we don't support it. So ultimately, they are not going to let us do something that they think is not good for families. But I want you to know that we currently serve our students 955.5 hours per year. Moving to a four-day week would reduce our dosage to 861 hours per year. <coughs> Minnesota's minimum number of hours for kindergarten is 850. So we're still well within what the state of Minnesota Department of Education has said is an appropriate year year, a school year for young children. So we've considered this carefully. Our policy council wholeheartedly supports it. Um, they, they believe in taking care of the teachers. They know how stressful it is to be around the kids. So, um, so I that is our And when does this go? When does this grant go to the Head Start? Uh, it's submitted May 1st, okay. and we often don't hear back until uh, July for yeah. revisions. Yeah, yeah. So, That's hard. Yeah, so it's a, it's a put it in a week. Member um, Being that we just had to add two minutes per class at the secondary level because we were too close to, or we were below the minimum number of hours, and you're citing the kindergarten minimum number of hours. Is preschool held to that standard of kindergarten hours, or is there, is there no minimum standards? Because I'm concerned about, of you know, any amount of buffer you may have for snow days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and and has that been discussed at the parent council? There hasn't. Uh, there is no minimum number of hours for Head Start, um, but <laughs> I do think we will be looking at ways to accommodate snow days. Uh, I think we all know when that is. And that's why when earlier when I spoke up about uh, concerns about enrollment, I knew this was also part of the thinking uh, because it is a change. Because I know that there are families, uh, there are directors I spoke about this, I know there are families who do need a day uh, opportunity for their you know, students. So I also want to make sure that we are not doing something that's going to really uh, deny those families um, the opportunity his recommendation. So um, I know it's been submitted as uh, something that Head Start will have to review and ought to be making a decision on. <laughs> Even with that, as a district, we also have the ability to assess. And if we think um, this is something that in practice we don't want to continue next year or the following year, we can always come back and say we want to revert back to a different model. Yeah, that's a good answer. Any other questions? <laughs> I would just like to say that if the change is made, that when we're thinking about the strong outcomes that you're receiving, that you're, you're achieving, uh, this does reduce the amount of service by 10% of all children. And I would be, I would want to make sure that the high levels of achievement remain if we were to keep this practice in place and it was like 
strongly recommend that we have the time back because I do think it was uh, reducing, reducing service by 10% to the kids is something a little bit. I think we should keep a very close eye on Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the Head Start presentation. So I'll go back to um, Assistant Superintendent Bonds for our next COW agenda item, which Thank you. is. The Could steps. You, uh, give me a, uh, a point of order. I would like to table an item. Is there, do I request for an, an item to be tabled, or how do I go about uh, We can just do that. Um, okay. We've done that before, okay. either taking something off or put something on because the call meeting is, is kind of flexible and less formal. Right. No, no, uh, well, I wanna, no, no votes need to be taken, no you. motion needs to be made. I want to thank uh, Assistant Director. Thursday for joining us, but we are going to table we will table the step pre, uh, the steps uh, presentation uh, okay. for next month, and we will move to our next presenter and presentation. And I have um, Cindy Miller, uh, who is here, media specialist, as well as the director of national from the directors of the National Center for Computer Science and Education. Jennifer is here uh, as well, um, and they will lead us in a presentation. So, Thank, thank you, and I understand you have a closed meeting coming up, so we'll be as brief as we can. Um, I wanted to start off, I'm Jen Rosado, the director of the National Center for CS Education at the College of St. Scholastica, um, and give just a little bit of context around computer science education. So nationally, over half of the high schools um, in the U.S. offer a computer science class, but in Minnesota, only one in five schools offers a computer science class. We are last in the nation for computer science. There are state level efforts going on. The Department of Ed is integrating computer science in the new subject area standards as they roll out. There's also been a bill in the House and in the Senate, and the governor has um, included computer science education in his budget proposal. So things are changing at the state level to improve, um, to improve it. And why computer science is important? We know from emerging research um, that computer science can support student learning beyond computing, so it helps improve math, reasoning, creativity abilities in students. Um, there's even one study from Broward County Public Schools that shows that students who had computer science in their elementary classrooms had increased uh, test scores on math, reading, and science. All right, so there's evidence behind it. It's also about access to well-paying, excuse me, well-paying careers. Um, without early exposure to computer science, students are far less likely to pick it as a career, and that means that they are missing out on over 8,000 open, unfilled computing jobs in Minnesota that pay an average of $90,000. That's something our kids should have access to. So for many of those reasons, we believe that computer science is important for our students to learn, and if you take a look at the handout, you can see that Duluth teachers have been engaging in doing um, this work. They started with some professional development in December 2021 with Computer Science Ed Week, um, and then they brought it to their students in May last year with the Spring into Coding event, and then this year they've been doing a whole bunch of activities um, with students across K through nine grade bands, and the district has committed to doing some awesome things as well. The coding clubs at the elementary school new high school class next year for computer science um, and has also committed to an NSF grant that we're hopeful we'll get funding for so it would bring together a number of school districts in Minnesota to work on those efforts um, so just very excited about Duluth Public Schools actually being a leader in Minnesota in computer science education and I'm going to turn it over to Paul and Cindy to talk more about what's been happening this year and how uh, that particular <coughs> effort is going in part because you all funded that effort all right so uh yeah thank you for having us here i'm paul schoenfeld and i am the district support coordinator with the center for computer science education and i have the wonderful opportunity of working with about 41 teachers from Duluth public schools um, and i want to share with you what we did why we did it and um, how we tried to reach all students in the district so we worked with 41 teachers in the subject areas of math. We worked with middle school math teachers. We worked with high school science teachers. We worked with um, library media uh, specialists in the elementary school, working with kindergartners, first graders, and second graders. And we worked with um, middle school math. Okay. And arts. And arts, and arts, uh, K-12 arts. 
Um, so we invited these 41 teachers to come to the College of Saint Scholastica in November, and they came and they did two nights of professional development. Um, and they had a, a overall a good experience. Um, the handouts that you have summarize some of their feedback that they gave us recently, um, and they. They informally said uh, they enjoyed being able to come and have dinner, and then over the next couple months, um, try out some computer science lessons in their classrooms. Uh, and we, so what we did was we took an inter integrated approach to embedding computer science within the existing subject areas, in part because of some of the fatigue that we just heard about uh, trying to do an add-on. This was integrating computer science within the existing subject areas um, in a way that is in line with the standards that are coming out from the Minnesota Department of Education that embed computer science within the subject areas. So uh, we had everybody come, try out the lessons, and they all implemented computer science in two or three hours um, of lessons within their classes in all those subject areas and had a good experience. Um, a couple of the outcomes are highlighted both in the students' experiences on the right-hand side of this um, handout. The second quote, and this is some of the why we're doing this, um, a student highlighted that this gave me an opportunity to work on code, which is something I hope to do as a profession. Um, and yeah, we're going to give you a, a chance to try out one of these coding activities here in just a moment. Um, but another why of why we're doing this is that students got to do problem solving and creative thinking. And so teachers highlighted in the bottom right hand corner that they saw students enjoying this code and go mouse activity that you're about to do. Because if something didn't go right, they could try again. And also noted that the students were very engaged in the problem solving aspects of the lesson and saw their students persevering and solving the problems. And uh, they think that the students who enjoyed the lessons the most were the ones who enjoyed the ability to experiment. Um, how did we try to reach all students? We were very strategic uh, about working with all the middle school math teachers so that we would re reach all the students in the middle school in their math class, give them exposure to computer science. Similarly with uh, elementary library media, we reached all of the kindergarten, first and second graders, giving them that early exposure to computer science. And all of the high school science teachers, uh, targeting specifically ninth grade physical science and some biology teachers as well as the span from K to 12 with the art teachers. So we reached all students, and we highlighted professional development that um, included, it included um, the universal design for learning framework to support students with disabilities and all learners, as well as um, things with culturally um, relevant curriculum and pedagogies for, for teachers to try out different classes. So I want to turn it over to Cindy, who can highlight uh, what the kindergartners do and give you a chance to try out for yourself. This is an activity that we did with kindergarten, first and second grade. This is Colby. He is a code and go mouse. And so with your partner, you need to put your paper together so that it makes a grid. Um, and this is what you'll do. Are you my partner? Or... Yes. Yes, she is. Okay. Um, and so uh, look this way. This Colby, Colby will, using computational thinking, um, you need to tell Colby what to do to get from the beginning spot to the cheese. The goal is to get to the cheese. And so what you'll do first is, of course, turn on Colby. And then you will program Colby to do the steps that he needs to do um, to get to the cheese. And so watch, just like this. The green button is go, don't push that yet. The yellow is to clear it, so go ahead and push the yellow button. And then you'll see on your grid, I mean the other one. You'll see on your grid that you need first, Colby has to go forward one box, then forward another box, then turn to Colby's left, and then go forward again. And so you have to, um, you have to code it. So it goes like this, forward, forward, 
Oh, Turn left. That's the orange. Don't give the answer. Them the answer. <laughs> and then you have to figure out how to get to the cheese. Oh. And then to make it run, and you may, it might not go the way you think it will, but you'll just try again. If that happens, try again. Um, go ahead and push the green button and see if your Colby goes where Colby is supposed to go. So let's see. So now he's like, you know what, I forgot to you. He's going to turn. He's not going to go anywhere. So the only thing is the water is clearing on the end. So, okay, so now I'm clearing. So, that's for a left. Yeah, we want to do it twice. So not the whole one, but we want to do it. And then you'll see, does it work the way you want it, or how would you change it? And then Remember that Cody will only do what you tell it to do. Okay, I'm going to try to do We're going to clear it. Right? Clear it. Yes. Action, action, action. Or I just want to turn if I put the turn in. Um, so push the yellow to reset it. Yeah, I did. You can have to do a whole circle. Okay, and then you're going to program it. So it'll go forward. We are. Forward. Success. Last winner. Oh, sure. Sure. I don't want to go back. It's easy to do this one. <laughs> I know I thought when you were going to have to go backwards. I know. Um, he might so once you've gotten it to work, um, would you uh, turn your mouth off, please? Turn off and um, pass it to the right. Do what I wanted it to go hyper, okay? There's one in every crowd. Pass your mouth to the right. Now we're going to give that to you. Yep, okay, I love it. We're going to get it. So I want to wrap this up because I know you have another meeting. We're having too much fun here. It's the best school board meeting ever. Our media specialists, elementary media specialists, there's five of us, were able to do this activity with our students because of the help with Computer Science for the Move and um and the work that we've done with them and uh moving forward if we do this in kindergarten first and second grade then what is it that we do next like and um and those things need to be developed uh, we're in the learning process as our as librarian as yeah. librarians moving toward um a future of what librarians are and what we do and how we do it. Um, this kind of thing is, uh, these are our new tools for research and development of um, young people's minds. And so um, I see a, the media specialist working with, and I'm, I'm on my own soapbox now, <laughs> um, working in, at the elementary level, but also at the middle school level and at the <coughs> secondary level to implement computer science activities and be leaders in our district as um, these things uh, come around in our school district, yeah. and it's about time. Yeah. Thank you. And Jane, I just I want to speak from the west end of town because I'm at Lincoln Park, and it definitely levels the playing field. And I had kids, especially last year and this year, that were completely disengaged with class, had done nothing all year, and we did the computer science, and they turned in amazing work. They, of course, asked what's in high school because I teach eighth grade. And the fact, I mean, it's 2023, we need computer science in our schools. So, I mean, the kids are interested, they're eager, you know, they loved it, and now they want it in the school. So, and is that what we've, we've offered an elective in the high school? Elective next year. In, in the high school? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Nine, open for 9 through 12. Right now, for 11th and 12th, but 11th we're trying 12. to change that so that it could be 9 through 12. So, yeah.
Is there a reason why it went 11, 12? I would think it would go 9, 10 if you're doing it. What math level they needed? Is that right? Oh, okay. okay. And there was some kind of misconception that they needed algebra two, but they don't. And so, it, and there are plenty of things. It's an advanced placement computer science principles class. College board places no restrictions except for algebra one being recommended to take for that class. So it could be 9 to 12. And typically, then, what license does the teacher that teaches this class have? In Minnesota, um, you are authorized if you have a math or a business license. However, you can, of course, do at a variance. Yeah, on a variance. Part of the bill that's in the <coughs> omnibus ed bill is to establish um, a computer science licensure for the state of Minnesota, so that we can solve this okay. problem and okay. it doesn't have to be math and just business. Okay, teacher. And Cindy, and if you can clarify it for me, I believe not this camp, but the um, the coding after school camp. Mm -hmm. That's the one that we funded by right, using our right. SR dollars. Yes. So these SR dollars, all those classes. No, it's are, it's oh, they're currently after school. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You also funded this through SR dollars. Uh, I was it was a combination of SR dollars from last year, I believe, but yeah, as well as funding from the CS for All Accelerator project. Hey, yeah. I, I just want to say thank you um, for, for the great presentation. I also uh, got to see the mouse in action at um, <laughs> yeah. the coding day that we yes. had, which was a lot of fun for our, our elementary kids, so they were getting a taste of it too. But I just want to say thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for having us. And can you introduce yourselves again? I, I missed that. Now, I know Cindy and I know Jane. It's, are, you, are you from College of Scholastica? And yep, I'm working with the, at Scholastica with the same organization as Jim, former high school teacher in Dewey. Okay. Oh, just sent us an email to the did I? Did I? Thought you maybe it wasn't so. All right, I'm getting it. And I'm, I'm Jen Rosado. Yeah, I'm at Scholastic. And I have a center for CS education. I wore my shirt Tuesday, but then you canceled the meeting. And I can't wear the same twice in a week. And no. Um, yeah, I school I did wear the same shirt for Nobody knew. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank our administration of teaching and learning that would jump on this. So are we going to be ahead of the omnibus uh, ask if uh, for having computer science offering in our high school, or are they asking for more? The legislative bill that's out there, it's computer science, right. it's civics, it, I don't know if it's all together, yeah. or the, the is current, it? The current part of the omnibus bill that includes yes. computer science yeah. education is to establish a working group that will set a state plan for what we want CS Ed to look like, but it does mandate that we can create CS licensure, um, and that the working group um, examine things like what's the requirement at K-8, do all high schools have to offer computer science okay. class, okay. and those sorts of things. So it's not asking us to offer it already next year or something? No, it's to put okay. a plan in place okay. and then to implement policy after the plan. And it does include funding. Oh, it does um, have funding? It includes some, some funding. Yeah. If anybody wants to advocate for additional funding, please reach out to me. We asked for $4 million, and it's only half a million in the budget. So We can okay. consider it for our next Yeah, yeah well, I, we're there, yeah. there in a couple weeks. I can email um, Assistant Superintendent Vons the link to the page that has the bill explainer and everything. If, if you all want to take a look at it at some point or for next year. Yep. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So it's an elective right now in both high schools. Yes. And, and the camps are just supporting because obviously this is, yeah, this is, this fun. is yeah. 21st century. Yeah. This is what it is. we should be um, getting our kids engaged in and yeah. having experience with the Okay. Um, okay. Have we ended? Oh, no, I'm, I'm with, I thought, no, we are. You're done? We are done. Thank you.